back. So let's just start with the uh, second lecture. Uh, but of course, first to recap. That's right. Okay. Uh, so just to briefly remind ourselves what happened on Tuesday, uh, it's there's been a lot of interesting things since, so it's perfectly, you know, uh, understandable that with all these exciting ideas, one might get decohered uh, due to scattering mechanisms. Um, so let's start with uh, a brief summary. So what we talked about last time, we said that, well, quantum and thermal fluctuations of the electromagnetic field can lead to forces between neutral objects, right? Uh, and this is known by several names, Casimir, Casimir Polder, uh, London van der Waals, whatever you want to call it, lead to forces. And uh, what we are interested in, and these forces are particularly significant when we go to nanoscales, and in particular thinking in the context of uh, nanoscale quantum systems, fluctuation induced forces and fluctuation induced phenomena more broadly. So not just uh, the you know attractive force, but uh, in addition to that, there's dissipation and decoherence, which becomes significant at nanoscales. And we have significant motivation to understand these effects in these systems uh, from the perspective of trying to build nanoscale quantum systems for quantum technologies and uh, also it's interesting that we are trying to think about boundaries uh, in going back to the Casimir picture as being something of a quantum thing itself, right? So fluctuation forces, just to summarize the second point, are a significant, not just forces, I would say fluctuation phenomena more broadly, because we are talking about the dissipative effects in addition to just the uh, dispersive forces. Okay. And now when you start thinking about uh, how do you understand these uh, fluctuation induced effects in quantum systems, the obvious approach to take is uh, one of open quantum systems, right? And that is indeed what we do. And this, uh, this now combines on the one hand, how we understand electromagnetic fields uh, at nanoscales near media, uh, and in combination with how do we describe the dynamics of an open quantum system, which can be driven, dissipative, can possess correlations and all that. And what we talked about last time was um, this side of the story. So I think we convinced ourselves that we can describe atom field interactions near media. Uh, and all we needed was three things as takeaways and I'll recap those as well. And what we are going to do today is the other half. So let's uh, just briefly recap the model, the toy model that we had. So we were looking at a system of N two level atoms that are placed near some medium. And I'm, I'm saying that it's a planar semi-infinite medium, but it really can be anything. So all, all I need is the, the generic properties of how this medium scatters electromagnetic fields, which you can solve Maxwell's equations in whichever geometry you like and obtain that, okay? Uh, for eventually the purposes of, you know, calculating things, if you want to do it more analytically, it is convenient to have something planar and uh, decent in analytical terms. Okay, so here we wrote the, um, when we wrote the toy model, we partitioned uh, this, this uh, into three, well, really two halves, which is the atoms being our system, the field, uh, which is, actually the Hamiltonians are right here, so I, do not want to repeat those equations, but we identify the atoms as our system. Now we have the electromagnetic field that is not in free space, but rather it knows about the presence of a medium. 
So this medium aware field or the medium assisted field, we are lumping it all in the uh, Hamiltonian of the Hamiltonian for field. And the interaction Hamiltonian uh, is the, you know, describes the interaction between the two objects. So field in this case becomes our bath. And uh, as you can see in this more colorfully delineated system bath partition, uh, we will now use this, uh, uh, you know, demarcation of the atomic Hamiltonian being the system and the field being the bath to obtain our master equation, which is what is the goal for today's lecture. And uh, we've seen this master equation and I've, I want to I want to display this because we've seen this a few times in Ronnie's lectures and in Gabriel's lectures and uh, we haven't yet actually derived this and I'm going to do that in particular in the context of atom field interactions and in particular in the context of atom field interactions when the field is confined by some boundary so I can you, you can think of you know a picture of the bath in this case, or the electromagnetic field being an actual bath, which is uh, interacting with many atomic subsystems that are illustrated by these little duckies. And the bath is confined by some boundaries, which you can think of as you know the boundaries of this bathtub. If you, so, so this is something you may have seen uh, elsewhere, which is that if you have a, if you've derived the, atomic spontaneous emission rate for a excited two level atom interacting with the free electromagnetic field, you would think of as a single ducky in an infinite pond. And uh, what we are doing today is a confined situation with multiple duckies, okay? All right. So let's keep that in mind for, um, uh, because we, we may come back to, I, I like this analogy because there's other things you can, uh, you know, think of the, that correlations as being represented by the ripples in the tub, which die fast. If you're in a Markovian-like regime, the two duckies kind of interact with via ripples on the on the water, etc. Okay, so now that we've established our system, um, let's let's get to business. And actually, I'm I'm not going to skimp on the math details today. So I will. Uh, I will go into the derivation uh, in as much detail as you want or littler as you, if you want as well. But I have to say the beauty of this derivation is, is really in the gory detail. So, so the beauty lies in the gore in this case. And uh, it depends on, of course, your taste for mathematical gore, how much you wanna see that. Uh, but the, the ultimately what illustrates the physics is the processes that go into um, each of the terms in the master equation, right? So for that reason, I will not skimp on mathematical details, but I will skimp a little bit here and there. I won't go through, you know, performing complex integrals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but if you do like complex analysis, it's not a bad derivation to do on a free afternoon, okay? Uh, all right. And the details, as I mentioned, are in, in this uh, uh, chapter that, we wrote with Akira Sone and Sebastian Deffer. Uh, you can find it there. Okay, so uh, let's first start with our starting point, which is that we have a system of, a total system of atoms interacting with the field. This is, uh, sometimes I, I forget and I call the field as the bass or vice versa. So let me just say that up front and atoms as a system. So if I replace the subscripts A and S and F and B, that's what's going on, okay? Having said that, uh, let's start with defining our dynamical picture, which is that I'm going to work in the interaction picture. And in this interaction picture, I will write my interaction Hamiltonian as e to the i H zero T or H bar, and let me also define what is H zero. The total Hamiltonian is atoms plus field plus interaction. And I'm going to call this 
as H zero, okay? And all right. Now we know um, the corresponding von Neumann equation for the density, the total density matrix here is And if I use this to write my row D uh, as tau, and substitute this back in there, I can arrive at the reduced atomic master equation by taking a trace over the field. Yeah. So, and, and that gives us a minus one over h bar square. There's of course an assumption that uh, my row zero commutes with h int tilde, okay? Um, and with that assumption, I arrive, hang on, I have to take the trace, forgot the trace. Uh, important thing I have unwitting un this is a this is all at tau okay I have not yet made the Markov approximation but I'm about to all right the sloppiness begins in the next step so this is your h int t h int tau rho of t Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is to make a Born and Markov approximation. And uh, perhaps you've seen this derivation before, but it doesn't hurt to see this one more time, just to be, uh, you know, extra vigilant of these approximations. Um, so you have trace over the field, d tau. Oops. I didn't mean to set it to infinity just yet. That's going to happen in the next step. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say that my atomic uh, density matrix, so this rho of t is rho a, so rho a tau, rho b tau. Uh, in making the Born approximation, I would assert that rho b always remains, the state of the bath always remains in equilibrium. Whatever state that is, thermal vacuum, it is always that rho b, okay? It does not change with time. And the state of the atomic system uh, is only determined by whatever the state is at that instant. So here we are making a Born-Markov approximation, okay? Number one but there's gonna be another, a second Markov approximation in the next step. Um, this uh, so far still doesn't give you, the, if you calculate the dynamics from this red field master equation, what you would still get is something that depends on the initial state of the system. So to be really independent of that, we make a, second Markov approximation. And to do that, we, let me take my, sorry, tau to t minus tau. My d rho a over dt becomes uh, trace over f. The limits don't change. I flip the sign twice as I change tau to t. And Now I'm going to make a second Markov approximation, which is to say that the correlations of my bath decay much faster 
than any time scale of observation as far as this master equation is concerned, okay? And if that's happening, uh, the upper limit of this integral, I can say, I can take it to infinity. And in doing so, what we are effectively saying is that you can you can think of uh, there being a time scale associated with you know how fast the bath correlations decay there's some e to the minus uh, let's say tau over tau b for the bath correlation time scale and if i substitute tau being equal to the system relaxation time scale the statement is to say that tau r over tau b is much, much greater than one, so that uh, as far as any appreciable system dynamic time scale goes, this thing you can ignore, okay? Uh, which is, again, the statement of your Markovian uh, approximation, okay? All right, so we have arrived as a consequence at the second order born Markov master equation here in highlighted in yellow. And there is a, a physical way to think about it. You can think of this, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, the set that you make tau, tau t minus tau. Ah, tau going to t minus tau. I'm substituting tau as t minus tau everywhere, right? So which happens here and there. And if I substitute tau going to t minus tau here, what does that give me? Uh, well, you can call this tau prime, for example. So then d tau prime is equal to minus d tau. And these limits become t and zero. So there's a minus from the d tau and there's a flipping of the limits that kind of cancel each other. It's just a change of variables, yeah. There is uh, now, however, a physical interpretation one can associate with this master equation or, or the kind of processes that contribute to this dynamics, which is that you can think of this as a, uh, as if the system is interacting with second order processes uh, with the bath. And there is an interaction that happens at some instant t and there's a process that takes place over a duration tau, actually, sorry, t minus tau, tau over a duration tau, and then at t, okay? Yeah. Yes. Wait, th there was an h bar? No, that wasn't supposed to go anywhere. Thank you, thanks for catching that. Yes, yes. Yes. I am replacing, wait, th I did that, right? I, I changed the row F to row B. I warned about that. So uh, row bath remains constant. Row bath doesn't change. So if your field is in some thermal equilibrium, it will always remain there no matter what. And again, that's a consequence of, you know, your baths relaxing much faster than anything system would do. Um, so that's this part. W was that your question? Tau going, to be tau going to, yes, that is a Markov approximation. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yes. Yes. Uh, that should answer your question, Alexandria. H bar is one. Yes. We haven't substituted, well, no, you, look, you change t to tau, sorry, you change tau to tau prime, but at the same time, you flip the limits. It's just a sign. We, we can talk about the algebra. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is that okay? Cool. All right. So uh, you, can, you can think of heuristically, you know, this master equation as representing second order processes like these, where the system scatters, interacts with the bath, scatter the photon, that photon comes back to haunted tau later, 
and uh, these effects is what gives right rise to all the fun things that we are going to talk about okay so um that's the intuitive picture to have in mind and we will actually uh, once we finish the derivation we will come to these processes and i have some animations drawn for you uh, which uh, i hope we can get to towards the end of this lecture okay so we have a second order master equation we have the hamiltonian what are we waiting for Let's calculate. So we have the uh, H interaction, as we know from the previous lecture, which is uh, sum over N. In our toy model, we have N duckies or N atoms, remember, equals one to N. And uh, each atom has its dipole, dN, and it is interacting with the electric field at its position, Rn. Um, there is a minus sign as well. So think of this as a, you know, the electric field kind of stretches and squeezes the atomic dipole and that's the electric dipole interaction. And uh, the dipole operator, as we also wrote before, is, oh, by the way, I haven't moved to interaction picture on the right side, but we will. So. We need to stick some e to the plus minus i zero t's on either side. I forgot which one was which side. Plus i zero was first. Okay. Okay. Cool. And uh, with that, let me copy paste. This minus sign won't really matter because you can see there's a there's two h ints, so that will go away. I'm writing it out of courtesy, but you know we don't eventually care. Um, dn, the atomic dipole operator, is that you can assume the d vector to be real for simplicity. There's um, nothing to lose there. The electric field is the one that is in the presence of the medium. So this is the new thing that we wrote last time, which is, uh, and here I'm going to use my green box for my green stencer. This green box for the purposes of convenience is the new, it, it's the propagator for uh, the field to go from point R to Rn. And uh, this, I'm going to use the shorthand, but maybe I won't make it green every time because that slows us down. Uh, but we think of this as, you know, any other propagator, okay? And we have these new uh, bosonic operators for the field as well from last time, which create or annihilate a photon at position R at frequency omega and the Hermitian conjugate of this, which is uh, F dagger. Okay, I'll draw it one more time and maybe not again, okay. Any questions here? The green thing is the green stencer. There is, I, I've heard there's a documented, uh, you know, phobia of green stencer among people. So for that reason, I'm trying to uh, be a little more schematic here. But if there is no such fear, I can, I'm, I'm happy to uh, go a full, full notation. Okay. Um, if you do have it though, I recommend sitting for one afternoon with a good mathematical methods book and it can be treated, okay? All right, so if I'm gonna apply, uh, if I'm gonna move to the interaction picture, then uh, let's see. So what happens in the interaction picture, we get a time dependence to all our operators. We have dn, e to the i 
omega zero t. That's good with everybody. So I'm just adding time dependencies to to the operators as according to their free Hamiltonians. Um, and let me just write G instead of uh, you know writing a green box. And the operators F and F dagger have, uh, they're the normal mode with the corresponding frequencies omegas for each normal mode. And they, in uh, this case, come with uh, frequencies e to the minus i omega t and e to the plus i omega t, right? Uh, G dagger, there's a dagger here too. And uh, this comes with an e to the plus i omega t. Okay. So we've moved to the interaction picture for the interaction Hamiltonian. Okay. And this really is all we need because now I can take that and plug this in there and I'm done. And well, no, you need to take the trace over the field. You need to perform the tau integral and you need to perhaps perform a couple other integrals coming from the, the field expansion, but uh, all that can be done. So our work in principle is done, but I wanna go one step farther to uh, the point where we can trace out the field and you can see how the um, how the different uh, how the master equation structure emerges out of that okay so let's do that and going back to the master equation we just wrote so I have a double commutator, which is this h int row a is a t, remember, and that. Uh, it's a double commutator, so there are four terms, and I'm going to look at just one of them, okay? So the four terms will be, uh, wait, I wanna, take too much time with algebra, but the so we've got h int t h int t minus tau rho a rho b uh, there will be And so you can see that each commutator gives you two terms. You have two commutators, so you get four terms. And I'm simply going to state these uh, quickly. And uh, then we play with one of them. And simplifying just one of those terms will already give us all the physics effects that arise in this scenario. And uh, that's where we, uh, we get more uh, exciting things and not a plus two minus signs now. So the H and T. Okay, good. So once, uh, you know, the, the point is that each of these terms is very similar in structure. So let me just treat one of these. So I want to, I did not mean to draw an arrow, I meant to draw a box. Uh, so if I take this term in the box, or rather including the prefactors and everything, and let me call this term number one and the other ones, one, two, three, and four. So I'm gonna simplify one of these and let's look at all the second order processes that go into making these collective atom field interactions, okay? So simplifying term number one, let's commence. Uh, 
and I'm going to okay let's still keep the prefactor for now um, it's a trace over field zero to infinity d tau the first term is h interaction t which we have just obtained okay the second term is the same thing at a slightly previous time t minus tau which we can also obtain by just putting t minus tau everywhere okay so let's do that and the third object here is uh, your row a row b that's just your atomic density matrix that you want to keep in your master equation and the field density matrix which uh, is i will assume in a thermal state because we are at a thermodynamics gathering um, i would normally put that in vacuum, and uh, that's where you get the explicit quantum fluctuation contributions. But we also want to understand what do the thermal contributions of the field do today, okay? And uh, therefore, rho b will turn out to be a thermal state. Okay, so uh, let's write the first term, which is your h int at d, and this comes with a sum over all the atoms and uh, the field modes, d omega, d3r. And uh, there is a dn sigma n plus dn star sigma n minus. Uh, it's, it's a dot because dipole is a vector, electric field is a vector. And uh, the second term pertains to the field. So this is your Green's tensor. So this is a vector dot tensor dot vector, which ultimately becomes a scalar as any good Hamiltonian should be. F actually is a vector. It, it contains a polarization uh, index, which is dotted with your propagator. Oh, I forgot time dependence. Sorry, hang on, we need more space. Um, let's move this downstairs. This comes with an e to the i omega zero t. And uh, the second term comes with an e to the minus i omega zero t. This comes to the need to the minus i omega t, and uh, the, the second term um, oops. it's out of habit. I write g as tensor. I promise this is going to be the longest expression that we will write, and after that, we're going to murder a bunch of terms, okay? So that's where the gore happens. And, uh, but bear with me. Okay, so, so far we've written H and T. I need the H and T minus tau now. So remember, we are simplifying uh, this object. We've gotten so far, that's the next step. We wanna use different dummy variables because the two Hamiltonians expressions can have different, can be pertaining to different atoms, M, or different field modes, omegas. So I'm going to use M for the next Hamiltonian index, and uh, omega prime and R prime for the field indices. And what's the time now? It's T minus tau. Right, uh, I knew some of you would look at your watches. Uh, don't need a G bar. Ha, huh. 
this needs to be R prime and omega prime. We are expanding in, again, normal modes with different indices. So this is all R prime, omega prime, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, F dagger, G dagger, uh, and lastly, e to the i omega prime, T minus tau. Okay, row A and row field, which I might have written previously as row B, but same thing, okay? Good. This is this is the longest it's gonna get. All right. This is this is what the uh, there we go. I tell my students not to write a, a, a slide full of equations, but uh, look at me here. So uh, the point is though we can now first of all take the trace over field. And how do we do that? So taking the trace over field, the first thing. Let's let's go a little sideways and uh, write a little, you know, how do you take the trace over field? You can use the good canonical commutation relations that we derived last time, which tell us that any uh, f r omega. Um, uh, hang on, the other way. F R prime omega prime is delta R minus, sorry, A A dagger. What am I? Hang on. Here. R minus R prime delta omega minus omega prime. And using this, we can simplify uh, the trace over field and, and all the field variables can be isolated nicely. So you have this trace over field. There are F, F daggers, uh, F, F dagger, and row F, right? So this, this F dagger is for, again, R prime, omega prime. Uh, and uh, so what we are collecting is these these terms, okay? If you're taking a trace over a thermal density matrix, who matters? For, if, if in particular we are talking about, it's a bunch of harmonic oscillators, right? Any, th this field, even if it's near a medium, it's ultimately just a bunch of normal modes that are harmonic oscillators. The thermal state is diagonal. So the only expectation values that matter are f, f dagger and f dagger f. So you can forget about the other terms, all right? And that is exactly what we're going to do. So we are going to uh, remember that trace over f, f dagger, r prime, omega prime for rho f. is equal to, what's this going to be? Any guesses? If it's a thermal field. Sorry? NTH plus one, perhaps? Oh, did you say that it should be N? Uh, but this is F, F dagger, so there's gonna be a plus one because of the commutation. Yeah, exactly. Great, so whatever the temperature of the field is, plus one, um, and that's it. And, and you get a delta, you know, R minus R prime, uh, omega minus omega prime, right? And this N thermal is your good old thermal occupation number. That's H bar omega over KVT minus one. Uh, similarly, your trace over the field for F dagger F, any guesses what that might be? That is just N, yes, thank you. And the deltas, okay, yes. Okay, so 
I'm saying that this state, rho f, is a thermal state, aka this can be expressed as a where Pn is your thermal uh, occupation probability. And if you use that here, and if you use, uh, you know, the, the number states of the field are uh, eigenstates of f dagger f operating on n will give you n n yeah so with those you can get to just like you do for a free space electromagnetic field the expectation value of the number of photons is uh, wait 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 nobody caught me there yeah there's no dagger on the second one uh, so f dagger f expectation value on a thermal state is n thermal and similarly uh F dagger F, sorry, A dagger A expectation value in free space for a thermal field is n thermal. Similarly, if we are in, in near this medium, everything moves to this new normal mode basis and the same relations hold, okay? The plus one comes from the fact that you have a uh, F F dagger, which you would write as F dagger F plus one, okay? Yeah, commutation relations. Okay. Yeah. Uh, same thing. R minus R prime, delta omega minus omega prime. All right. So we are fully capable of taking trace over the field. And in fact, we have already taken the trace over field. So I can kill some things. And I'm going to. I will uh, make, uh, let, let's say, let's say I make, I make a copy of this. You may not have that facility in your notebook, but uh, I do currently. So here I can kill the strays. Uh, oh, something else happens. Delta functions uh, kill some integrals. Yes. Up. Where? There should be a row F. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, indeed. The trace is being taken over the state of the field, which is thermal. Okay, I'm killing, I'm in a killing spree now. Uh, we've killed the trace. We've killed, I meant to grab the eraser here. Cool. Um, who else? Any names? I can, I can get rid of FF daggers, we just took the you know, trace, so that can go. And uh, the thing is that we don't need to worry about the F, let, let me put this, uh, I don't wanna, sh let me shrink this a little bit. Okay, not too crowded, that's fine. Um, okay, so, so the, the terms that get combined Let's recap, are this F and that F dagger and uh, F dagger here with F, okay? And let's see what that combination gives us. So F, F dagger, the yellow ones, as we have agreed, gives us a N plus one, N thermal plus one, is that right? Uh, and if we've agreed on that, uh, and, and there's a delta omega minus omega prime, delta r minus r prime, which makes this omega same as omega. So let me make sure that omegas are killed. Uh, everybody's omega prime. And uh, in combining these two, what am I gonna get? I'm going to get from the expectation value of f and f dagger. Oh, and their polarization indices must also match. So if you're taking, Again, if you're taking a commutator, everything has to have the same indices. Uh, so whatever g dot f that index was must match with the g dagger index over here. So let me, um, let's do it this way. So if, if I'm combining this yellow part 
the exponentials, let's combine them first. So I get a e to the minus i omega t with e to the plus i omega t minus tau, which gives me e to the minus i omega tau, is that right? Do we agree? And then I get g dot instead of f dagger, uh, I can just replace this with uh, g dot g dagger, okay? Now let's deal with the, oh, and this is this is gone now. All right. Um, now for the f dagger f part, uh, what am I gonna get? Uh, the exponentials combine as e to the i omega t goes with e to the minus i omega t minus tau, which gives me an e to the plus i omega tau. Okay. And uh, f dagger f, we have all agreed that this is n thermal omega. So let's do that. Oh, I forgot, I forgot n thermal plus one here. Sorry. This is uh, n thermal omega plus one. And this comes with a g, g dagger instead, okay. Okay, and row A still hangs around. We, we, we need that row A. We are writing a master equation for the atomic density matrix. Okay, this is simpler, right? Uh, we've, we've killed the field so far, which is great. The next thing to kill is, uh, uh, actually at this point, uh, you can already start, I, I'll do one more thing. So. Remember when we were talking about this Green's function, we said that it has some nice properties because ultimately it is a response function. And if your, you know, if, if your medium and environment around you is a linear, has some linear response, uh, under linear response theory, you would have some nice properties of this Green's function that you can use. And I'm going to state that here, which will allow me Green tensor uh, linear response leads to a fluctuation dissipation light relation, which can be stated as, uh, let me write this. Um, so basically your G, G dagger, D3R becomes, seeing this in my notes, but I do, writing this from my memory. Clemens, please correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Uh, Imaginary G. Okay, let me let me uh, do a couple of things. This G has a couple of indices. So if you were to trace where this G and G dagger are coming from, there's an intermediate R, N, R, omega. This G has an index similarly R, N, R, omega. So you can think of this as a photon going from, move my screen, sorry, where? Is that, oh, 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 uh, sorry. So if you, if you were to keep, the, keep track of what the uh, position inside these green sensors were as to where, where are these photons going, okay? So they come from Rn, they go to R, and the G dagger, on the other hand, has, a, uh, has the same indices R into R, in, in, and it's a G dagger, so it takes, something from Rn back to R, or R back to Rn, right? Uh, same thing at frequency omega. Uh, and so you can think of this as being akin to a fluctuation, which is why we refer to this as a fluctuation dissipation relation here. So this, let me write this as GR1, oops, change of color. 
was not intended. G R one R omega G dagger R two R omega becomes G R one. This is one, this is two, R one, R two omega. Okay. Uh yes. Yes, that's the vacuum permeability. Yeah. Okay, so so this is something that any good uh, linear response theory uh, propagator does. And knowing this, we can kill something else also. And I am going to, therefore, uh, use this to... eliminate g dagger g and g g dagger and this integral over d3r okay yes Can you the the prime? we've killed primes now remember because we we said uh when we were doing this trace over the field mm -hmm. the intuition behind that is you were you have to catch the same photon back and those two frequencies should be the same, the omega and omega prime. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, oh, oh, okay, so so good point. Uh, it's not R prime, but it's Rn and Rm. That's a great point, so thank you. So what's happening is that, uh, uh, very well noted, one of these Gs is associated with Rn. One of these G daggers is associated with Rm. That comes with the dm, etc. Um, and that is precisely the propagator for the field to go from dipole n to dipole m. Okay. These these are the the squiggly pictures we drew last time, and perhaps we'll also get to draw. Maybe not today, depending on time. So, um, okay, but we, we're, we're almost there. We are almost there. So if you look at this, uh, I can kill that and that and that, okay? And that is precisely what we're going to do. So I get to uh, remove this. I get to remove this and replace it with the appropriate quantities which would be coming up soon. So I've got uh, some prefactors, whatever those were, uh, h bar mu zero over pi I mean, those are ultimately not too important because I'm just going to state the final results, but you know, if we were being pedantic, um, then, right, uh, the, the, here you get an imaginary G of Rn, Rm, omega, okay? The Green's function still depends on the frequency. Uh, there's a sum over, fre the, the integral over frequency is still around because we have to sum over different modes and different modes scatter differently because you are near a dispersive medium possibly. So, you know, you don't have that luxury anymore of everybody has the same response. And here we get the uh, same Green's tensor, imaginary G uh, comes with a Rn, R M omega. Okay. Now I would say we are there. And why do I say that? I've boiled this whole thing down to something that only contains operators in the atomic subspace, aka sigma n, sigma, sigma n plus, sigma n minus, m plus and minus, right? So you can kind of see that these terms will combine to give you something master equation like there will be yes
that comes from this uh, fluctuation dissipation relation, okay? I will not be able to give a derivation for that now, but if you wanna chat about it, we can talk, okay? Um, okay, but here, if you, if you squint your eyes, and if you say, uh, well, one thing is that you can see uh, all of these integrals over, let me actually go one more step. Maybe I'll, I'll have to stop here. How much time do I have? Few, few being uh, 60? Five, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, I was saying 60, but uh, yeah. five, right. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up and we'll get to the master equation, physical interpretations next time, tomorrow. Um, okay, so uh, one more step to master equation. Okay, the uh, last thing I wanna say is when we're combining these terms, by the way, I never uh, made any rotating wave-like approximations. However, in this expression, you can see that there will be terms where you will have combinations of things like e to the i omega zero t coming with an e to the i omega zero t minus tau that rotates at two omega zero. So you don't want that. Uh, so you want this with that and the sigma n minus with the other one, right? So let me do that, RWA, rotating wave approximation, to simplify this to, again, I don't think keeping all these prefactors is important or necessary for the purposes of what we are trying to do, but uh, force of habit. Sigma n plus comes with, uh, let's see. So 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 let let me actually collect these terms in a different way. So I'm going to combine the n gets dotted with this imaginary g, right? And uh, effectively, uh, what we we get two different terms. So we always have a, the, the vector part is always dn dot imaginary g, which you can take as a common factor, rn rm omega dot dm. There's a physical meaning to this, which we will come to, which is dm is kind of the dipole, it is the dipole of the mf atom from which a virtual photon is being emitted at rm traveling via the Green's function to Rn and then interacting with the dipole dm, okay? So that's what's there. And we will see this appears in, in future expressions as well. Um, but there's a physical meaning to this. The rest of it is, uh, so there's an n thermal omega plus one, which comes with e to the minus i omega tau, plus n thermal omega, e to the i omega tau, and Okay. That's much simpler and cuter. I think we can all agree. Now, um, the two remaining tasks here are to perform the integral over omega and tau. Well, you can perform the integral over, to, over tau pretty much in your head because you will see uh, the integral over tau only pertains to the exponentials, e to the plus minus i omega tau, and integral over exponentials gives you delta functions, which is nice, and some principal part also, which in this case is very important because that is uh, something, you know, that, that uh, that's not just at one delta frequency, omega minus omega zero, but that gives you a contribution from all the frequencies. And that broadbandness is very uh, essential to the vacuum fluctuation mediated interactions. So that is the, see, I, 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 as I said that, you know, these mathematical steps have all physical meanings behind them. So if you perform this integral over tau, the delta function is going to give you a contribution 
from the resonant processes and the principal part is going to give you contributions from everything else okay so that's how you um, that's the you know thing to remember about the tau integral um and then you can uh get the omega integral afterwards which um hang on i forgot a sum over m because we we haven't said n is not equal to m necessarily right so uh right but but now once you've performed the integrals over tau and omega everything is essentially in terms of sigma n plus sigma n minus and rho a so it's all in the subspace of your atomic uh hilbert space the the collective atomic hilbert space and therefore i can claim that this is going to lead to a master equation which i will discuss next time but let me just very quickly display what that master equation might look like and uh, i will where is the there's the powerpoint yeah here okay um further down further down Here it is. It's a good Lindblad master equation with a Hamiltonian part and a uh, dissipator, which happens to be Lindblad, as we will see. And we will uh, go through the you know, interpretations of all these terms that arise from uh, all the uh, derivations that we've done today. Okay. And, uh, and I will have animate. Oh, wait, no. This is perhaps the better point to. Uh, mention that. Okay. Let me stop here and I'll continue tomorrow. Yes. And I guess I've never understood why it is about um, to ignore that. That's a very good yeah. question. Yes. Um, it is not robust enough. You can, well, actually, in what we will derive, uh, you see, I didn't make RWA at the Hamiltonian level. When we wrote D dot E, we kept terms that were of the kind sigma plus A dagger and sigma minus A, which, as we will see, will lead to processes that happen on much shorter time scales. Meaning, well, processes that are relevant at time scales of uh, omega zero plus the characteristic frequency of the photon, the well, inverse time scale, uh, inverse of that. So if uh, the effect that you're looking for, so it depends on what physics are you looking for, right? So if you are looking for, um, uh, interaction that happened on those time scales, then you cannot ignore those terms. So it, it ultimately is a matter of uh, where you make the RWA uh, sets a time scale, sets a characteristic time scale. And uh, uh, yeah, if, if you're looking at effects that are at much slower or, you know, time averaged for for a very long time, then you do not care about the non-rotating wave terms, roughly speaking. It's not a rigorous explanation by far, though. I want to comment here. This is a very good question, because that makes the master equation that I presented that easier to understand. Because it's the same thing. It's the very strict energy conservation. And the rotating wave approximation is good. Hmm. Right. So then you can ask, okay, when can you do that? So the master equation is a basically where it's a first rating in time, which is exactly what you described. Because you know, if you go at some thought that you have reach equilibrium, then you need strict mm -hmm. energy conservation. Because if you go for a very short time, energy is not conserved. Yeah. To, to yeah. Energy is conserved up to one of the best. So at short times, you can have non-conservative energy come down. But the 
longer time, they should only be. Mm -hmm. So this is So there are four weeks in short time, which is one time mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, great question. Uh, interaction is retarded in how retarded are we talking? Well, uh, so, so if we are talking about retardation effects still on the time scales of, you know, um, uh, so if, if you're not getting to coherence length, co coherence time scales, this should be fine, I would think. But uh, if you get there, of course, you start getting, uh, you need to go beyond. Well, you also need to go beyond Markov approximation there. But we can discuss more actually. I am interested in retardation effects from a separate angle and in, in terms of you know non Markovianity that arises from there. But, uh... The question is if it's an interesting effect that we can find between the quantum fluctuator and the mm -hmm. quantum surfaces, right? And these quantum fluctuations are sort of get killed by another type of fluctuation, which is the electric field. Oh, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah. You, you need, need very, very, yeah, for these experiments. Okay, but those are ions, so they have real charge. No, but then even atoms can be like a ring of every atom in front of the surface, right? Yeah. There's an electric field fluctuation. Uh -huh. um, so that also can, can tend to sort of cohere many of these. Uh, Correct. Things. So are, are, are people that are thinking about them, sort of uh, study, thinking about them, these things, so, bring in actually the it's an incoherent effect, so, but, but, it's, but it's real, it's there. Uh, the fluctuations of the classical noise of electric and magnetic fields around, the answer is yes. So there is a decoherence from those near surfaces, and uh, there are papers about it in academia. So, there are things, there are things yeah, it, it, has, it has been discussed, and uh, particularly one that I'm remembering off the top of my head is for spin decoherence, uh, near surfaces uh, in the context of atom chip experiments where if yeah. the conclusion there is if you go to a superconducting surface, that's great because yeah. you don't have as much electric field, magnetic field noise. And uh, yeah. yeah. Magnetic field noise, of course, is only common, but electric field noise is the noise of gravitation, which is near, near the surfaces. Magnetic fields are the spin, which are more embedded in the, in the material. So that's, that's some of the difference. So the electric field noise that you're referring to, just for me to understand, this is uh, due to the... Yeah, you have these fluctuating dipoles on different surfaces. Right. In many surfaces. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah. It's not, it's not sure, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, from the traditional derivation, where you don't have a matter, you end up getting scattering of the things described by the same sensor. Mm-hmm. You mean in free space? Yeah, yeah. It's just e to the i k r minus r prime, right? Yes, that. But I mean, like, because you said that there was a, a way to do this without the weight sensor formula. Is there a. Wait, did I say that in the presence of matter? I don't know of one. If you're in the presence of media, you need a response and yeah. you need a propagator to contain the you know re response function within. So. Um, I'm not sure what uh, other. Well, yeah, uh, but see, they're not that scary. No, That's my no. point, and it's it's just a you need to remember just a couple of identities. You know, your good old canonical commutation relations, except now applied to these new normal modes, and 
the fact that your greens functions are good linear response thing so that's it um so if you're good with that we can get to the master equation i hope we all believe this and i will continue from here tomorrow Fantastic. cool thank you very much